Compliance is a profession where people work tirelessly to make the world a better place. And there are hundreds of amazing and inspiring women who have helped the field develop into what it is today. Great Women in Compliance is part of the Compliance Podcast Network. So join Mary Shirley and Lisa Fine as they talk with women in compliance who are making a difference. Hi, welcome to the Great Women in Compliance Podcast with Mary Shirley and Lisa Fine. We're on the Compliance Podcast Network and we are also supported by Corporate Compliance Insights. This is my first interview of 2022 and I'm so excited to have Sonia Sterneman, who is the founder and managing director of Structural AG. That's a consultancy based in Switzerland, which focuses on preventing fraud and non-compliance, and they react to potential breaches as well as cybercrime and so many other services. Sonia is also the co-host of The Human Factor, Corporate Integrity Matters. I got to know Sonia earlier in 2021, and we was on her podcast in November. And once I got to know her, I immediately wanted to be friends, but also to her to share her views and expertise to our community. So Sonia, thank you so much for joining me. Um, really appreciate you being here. And before we talk about what you're doing now, can we talk a little bit about how you got into compliance? So first of all, thank you very much, Lisa, for having me here in your and Mary's show. It's really a pleasure. And um, I'm, so, I'm so grateful. And also to talk to you again after only two months now, you know, <laughs> I'm a big fan of your work and recommend recommended to all of my female peers here in Switzerland, but not only, and also to clients who are in the compliance industry. So thank you very much. Well, thank you so much for that. So um, you have a lot of interesting clients and work, but let's start with how you got into this. So it's somehow, it's a very short story, but also very long time ago. It was 1992 when I used to work at one of the largest banks in Switzerland here in internal audit. At that time, we never used the expression investigation or things like that. We only named it special audits, but in fact, it was nothing else. And I realized not only the different fraud patterns in financial services, but also how management reacts to misconduct, for example, and what is needed to get heard as internal auditor. So fact finding and reporting is much more than just an audit report and people you know, people are just or did not have the chance to know exactly what they have to do. And I think it was also a process. And this was the moment when I decided to do more than just auditing. It was clear to me I wanted to see behind the scenes and also to investigate and analyze the patterns and the behaviors and to understand what is needed that people become fraudsters. So I love the combination of different disciplines. And I'm a Swiss certified public accountant and trained economist. So I'm not a lawyer. And then this was the moment when I just, you know, became addicted to all these kind of topics here. <laughs> and it is such an interesting world in, in Switzerland with the different kinds of, of fraudsters and other issues. We'll talk about that later, too. But before that, let's talk about your podcast in, in the title. First of all, it's the human factor. Corporate integrity matters. What does that mean to you and how do you define corporate integrity? It was an interesting question or it is an interesting question. And you are not the first one asking me that because for me, corporate integrity is somehow the DNA, the deep understanding of the agreed set of values you have in a, in a corporation or in a team to successfully steer, lead and drive an organization, but also taking shareholders and stakeholders into consideration. It's much more. And for me, Integrity, on one hand, is referring to the quality of a person's character. But on the other hand, if you're an organization, it's not just the sum of all people being or acting with integrity. And I think that's also the, um, how should I say, the, the challenge sometimes, because you have so many different people, so many different cultures, also here in Switzerland. And you ha I have a different perspective, uh, perspective on integrity, as I believe that the sum is not going to be what we see at the end from a corporation. You know what I mean? Or what I try to explain? It's, I think the interactions and we all as a corporation or organizations are made up by people because an organization as such is just, these are people and relationships and we always react to each other. And um, without the people, we wouldn't exist as a corporation. I think you also answered my follow-up on that is that how is the human factor? Well, that's good though, because how is the human factor the key to that? And, and if I'm listening to you, it's how they are, you know, people are all working together to come up with the ethos or to make, you know, a company have more or less integrity and you can have the rules and the policies, but if you don't have people buying in and doing the right thing, what matters? 
Exactly. So I think, you know, for me, integrity is much more. It's not just the policies and rules or whatever, whatever we have. So, you know, if, if a code of conduct is not understood, it, it just doesn't work, you know. And I think in a, in a perfect world, we wouldn't need to have all these written policies, but we could also act with integrity. So it's not about the policies at the end, whether we act with integrity or not. And that's exactly what you said, you know, it's all about us. It's about the humans, about the role models we have in place or even not have in place. So for me, integrity is a mindset and the way of leadership at the end. Yeah, I mean, making a great point about policies, too, because if pe- you can have the greatest policies in the world, but if it's so hard to understand and there are long pages and people don't feel like they have to do the right thing or they're not feeling responsible to one another, then it doesn't matter as much. Yeah, and, you know, I think you can also pay a fortune to get all these kind of policies and that adjust it to your organization. It doesn't work as long as you don't have, you know all the people understanding it, and I mean all of them, and especially the C-level and the board of directors living it, you know. What I see so often, people on that on these levels are just not following it, you know. And people always observe others, and they behave like that. <laughs> right, exactly. And even if you're, I think a lot about the C-suite to us is always traditionally, you know, the tone at the top. But yep. there are a lot of people that are, you know, the message is the, the message in the middle who to some people that is their top. So you have to make sure you know, if you're working in, in, in an office and you have your general manager as the person who impacts you much more every day as opposed to necessarily the CEO. But how do you, you know, bring that down as a message? Absolutely. And, you know, people observe each other. That's also some kind of social control we have. But on the other hand, you know, if you have a bad role model, you are always a role model, either a good one or a bad one. Right. And we have to be so careful to how, who are we going to hire to do that, to be a role model? Because everybody is a role model to, to, every, to anybody, you know. It doesn't matter what kind of level they have at the end, you know. When you enter a, an organization, at the moment we don't do that because we are just in our virtual world <laughs> right now. But, but, you know, when you enter it and you have the first person um, sitting at a desk, that's some kind of role model also and displaying the behavior and the values an organization has. Yeah. No, Absolutely. Um, and with that, I think, you know, when you're brought in to support an organization, whether, you know, proactive or more often even you know, reactive, what to you looks like the, the foundation or the markers of what would be a strong program that you're you know, improving? We, we look at that right away. I'm guessing tone for the top and the leadership is one. Absolutely. And, you know, it's really how you perceive what they are doing and what they are saying you know for me it doesn't matter what you have in your policies at the first you know at the, at the very beginning you I don't care about they what they have written I would like to see the all the unwritten stuff they they have within the organization and these are the informal ways and processes the informal um, rules they have how they treat people for example and as I said before you know when you enter a building you feel what's going on you know, you, you also recognize how people are talking to each other, for example. Mm-hmm. Uh, how, you know, it's all these, how should I, these soft factors at the very beginning. And then you go into all the details and see, okay, for example, they have, they have a code of conduct just to start with. But if people don't understand what it's written there, they just can't, they just can't follow. And they, it's not their fault. It's the fault of of the organization or the ones being responsible if it's, it can't be understood. You know, there are so many dilemma situations. I had a client just a few weeks ago and, you know, they just copy and paste the code of conduct from, from a competitor. So, but these are not the values they have, you know. I said, hey, guys, it doesn't work like that, you know. Of course, you think you have saved a lot of time and money, but at the end, it's your crew and you have a different DNA. Yeah, it is funny when, when that <laughs> happens sometimes. I, I had... I have a wonderful community of compliance people that I, and one person I was asking a question about a particular policy and they said, here's, you know, here's ours, here's a sample, which is one of the great things. I sent it to somebody in our, in our company. And I said, this is a sample. We can start for, for like, this is great. Why don't we use this? I'm like, because this is a completely different industry and a completely different group of people, but they do have some points that we can use as a, as a start. And I've learned from it and it made me laugh so hard. It's like, you know, no, you can't just, you can't. No. And it, 
it's a process, you know, and if you really go now step by step, because what we did now with that client said, okay, you can start with that, but then really go sentence by sentence and let me know what you understand with that, you know, and at the end, <laughs> we had a complete, we had a complete different code of conduct and it was worse to have that workshop, you know, because then they just realized, and it was on sea level, they realized that if they have to tell their people what needs to be understood, it's a complete different story. Yeah, absolutely. It was great. (laughs) That sounds like one of the immediate signs of a weakness you might see in an organization. But what else do you see right away if you're going in and identifying that you see, you know, is also symptomatic of some of the bigger things you'll need to work on? (laughs) It's a taboo. Nobody wants to talk about compliance. (laughs) You know what I mean? They just don't like it. People don't like compliance. They also don't like auditors, you know, and we don't take that personally, but as long as you have a taboo, you don't give the topic enough space. Right. You are not creative on that. And for me, compliance or risk or governance and all these kind of topics, it needs to be a creative process. You know, we need to lead, to learn from each other. We need to 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 know who is sitting together with us at the table. Yeah. You know, what kind of inform, what kind of um, background and also experience do they have? What could they bring in? Normally, people did not start with one firm and don't leave it um, until they are <laughs> retired. But you know, it was it was in the past, and in some Swiss companies, you still have that. But you know, we all are somehow um, socialized, mm-hmm. have different experiences, and as soon as you give this kind of cultural background um, space. Yeah. Yeah. It helps you. To, it helps you to to build up. How should I say, a culture of integrity? Yeah, and these are the, the the strong points. And on the other hand, but what I see, I think in eighty percent of the of the cases, it's a taboo, and they they just put you to the um, to the legal counsel or the compliance officer to to, to discuss that with that person. But that's not enough, you know. Mm-hmm. Compliance and also governance and risks they are strategic pillars, and it needs to be taken up on that level. Right. Yeah. And, and, and the, the period of getting people to recognize that can also be the big part, probably a lot of what you do and can be a real challenge at times. Um, it is. It's a, just a very, you know, what I would like to do is just um, to, um, raise the awareness. I think it's exactly the same for you. We have to raise it and make it understandable for all levels. And I also think it's important to make it approachable. Just talking to you, you do yeah. that as well. But there, are, I've, I've talked to a lot of people that are outside compliance or legal in organizations and they're you know basically they will often feel like the first answer is no the second answer is look at something obscure in a policy and you know one of the things that I try to do is say you don't have to know all the policies but what you are responsible for knowing are what are red flags what seems like that could be a problem and what do you need to raise to someone who does this every day that and and people respond better to that than thinking they have to memorize a bunch of policies. Absolutely. And that's what you said with being approachable, you know. What I like to work is, uh, what I like to do is working with uh, dilemma situations Mm -hmm. from their industry and saying, hey, this could happen to you tomorrow. And it also happens to you. When you go to the corruption part, for example, you know, they have so many cases. They could come up with all these case studies by themselves. And that's what I like to do in the yeah. workshop. Say, hey, thinking like a fraudster, you know, right. what could go wrong here? Or the, which are the situations you face every day? And we just don't know about that because people are not coming back and telling um, your colleagues what, what happens out there. And, you know, when they can learn from each other, Mm-hmm. Within the industry and within the same firm, most of the firms that are really um, on global levels, they immediately have all these cases together and then they know what it means and they know how we would expect they should behave in that situation. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. One of the things that you asked me on on your <laughs> podcast, and then I'm going to turn the tables Um so, and I'll answer first what I told you, because you asked me about when there was an, any instance where I felt my integrity was challenged. And that's one you take a little while to think about. Um, and one of the things that I, I thought about was that I was involved in an investigation in another language. We had both a translator and an attorney on the phone. It was, it was or Zoom, whatever technology we had to use that day. And the person basically admitted to something but didn't necessarily realize the consequence of what they said. So after the fact, they said, you know, Lisa misinterpreted what I said. And even though I had my notes, 
I had a, a lawyer who spoke their language and a translator for exactly this reason, because I, I mostly because of the language challenge and I didn't want the lawyer to be considered biased. Um, but it was, you know, still, I took it a little bit personally because I, I thought, you know, I wasn't, that wasn't my approach. You actually volunteered this, but I did feel I was challenged and I tried to handle it not defensively, although at times I was probably a little more. So with you and with that long introduction, just because I feel turn, turn around is fair play on this one. Um, Thank you. <laughs> um, what about you? Have you had any situations where you felt someone challenged your integrity? Yes. And it, it's a really personal one. And um it was once challenged by an unethical offer for a signature, you know, because I'm um, I'm a CPA, I'm Swiss certified, I'm public accountant. So, so me as an individual, but also my, also me as a professional, were put under pressure to act against the ethical standards we have in our profession, and even more on my personal integrity. And as you know, me a little bit, I can't be bored. And it was a moment when I immediately, within seconds, handed in my resignation that I would I would always do that again, and. But before that, there were weeks of not giving me access to the necessary underlying details needed to judge on the recoverability of these assets. So I was put under pressure just to sign and tell them that it was it was okay. And without performing a due diligence to come up with an opinion, I couldn't state or agree on these asset values um, values, and I really handed in my resignation. Because if you as a you know. Just me as a person, I would never ever sign something. It was it was really material, you know, without having the underlying ba- underlying base and basis. And um, yeah, it was hard. It was um, it was interesting. It was also over Christmas. Um, they it was a process of several weeks. They really forced me to do so. And I was sitting in that room, and they told me how much I would need for that signature. And I said, hey, guys, I don't need money for any signature. I need to have the underlying. I would like to come up with my opinion. And if not, I'm just leaving right now and resign. Yeah. It's, and that's what I did. <laughs> yeah. Well, that takes a lot of courage. And one of the things that one of my mentors, as I started working in-house, said one of the things is in, in our jobs when you're in the in-house role is you may have to be prepared to stand up for something or resign from your first day. Now, it, in some ways, it's a little cynical, but then with stories and what you're talking about, yep. it's a very, very real challenge. I really did that, you know. And when I tell you that, I still get goosebumps because it was it was hard somehow because I exactly knew what I have to do and then what I will do. But yeah, it. I was quite young at that time and I did it and I had no clue what, what's coming next, you know? <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's the right thing to do, but sometimes it's, you know, the right thing to do and the easy thing to do are often not the same. Uh, Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so also you're, as we mentioned at the beginning, you're based in Zurich in Switzerland, which is really one of my favorite places. I had worked before my current role at gate group for a long time. And I really missed getting to go there. Um, as much as I did and getting to know it's an amazing country. The other thing is though, I was aware of challenges for being a woman working in in Switzerland and particularly in legal or ethics and compliance. Um, Do you find any unique pressures in your experience? It also could be my American self to be fair. (laughs) <laughs> no, 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 absolutely no. What I see is really, you know, I'm used to that somehow, you know, because I always, as a, as a CPA, you are still, you, you only have 10 to 5% of women doing that. And I'm always surrounded by men. So I'm just used to it for the last 30 years right now. So, but I know that, you know, it's different. And most of the time, I'm the only woman in the room, in the meeting room or also in the boardroom, because I also serve as an independent board member. And what I do, I just encourage all women and men to follow their vision or mission, no matter how hard it sounds some, somehow. And I think it's also more in focus than it was 20 years ago. It was just as it was, you know, and it's also not easy just to bring everything together. That's what I try. But you have to you have to do that on a private way here in Switzerland. You know, you don't have the same support as you maybe have in the Nordics. And you are still seen as, you know, it's not the common role models we have here in Switzerland. If if a woman like you or me just work, work full time, follow the mission or vision we have and, you know, just do that and also taking over the re- um, leadership roles. And I think it's it's different to also to the U.S. I don't know whether it's harder. It's just different and you are still a minority and you have to find your way how to can manage that for you and your family somehow. Because I think you also have kids and I'm not sure, but I have kids, you know, for example, and 
I just manage it somehow. Of course, yeah, these are my priorities. And then, you know, my vision or my vision is just making integrity approachable, as you said. And so I have to follow that vision. Yeah. Well, I think, and, and I don't have kids, but I also think oh, that's also looked at a little bit differently too when you're, I mean, when I would go to Switzerland, also with the change in administration at the time, I, I got there at the beginning of the Trump administration um, and also sort of the change of world le- leaders from Obama to Trump versus being an American woman and also being responsible for bringing up American concerns. Um, you throw all of that together and even in the best of circumstances, it could be a bit of a challenge. On the other hand, people were always happy to listen, as you said, as long as you mm-hmm. kind of try to do it in the right way and make sure that you spoke in private or raised the concerns um, and and a little bit of self-awareness. I remember I was talking to uh, the CFO, at the new, a newish CFO at the time, and I looked at him. I said, I, I've got to warn you, I'm about to sound like very American and very much like a lawyer. Um, and it was just three of us in a meeting. And he said, I'm glad you're self-aware. And we <laughs> left. But that wouldn't be a reaction that you would normally get if you were doing this in a larger scope or was a challenging thing. Whereas in the U.S., I think everyone would be kind of start yelling at each other partway through. <laughs> it's a good point you raised right now. You know, that's, yeah, that's also what I have to do sometimes. Tell him, hey, that's my role I have right now. You know, if I'm also chairing all the committees, for example, and I have to ask these nasty questions because it's my role and my responsibility. And that's also what I do when I'm in the meetings. And hey, guys, you know, normally I'm quite, I'm quite a nice person, but now I really need to have that information, <laughs> you know. So, so I think the self-awareness part and also, you know, don't take yourself so seriously somehow. <laughs> <laughs> it always, and humor always helps. <laughs> yes, it does. It does. Um, one other thing is you've also built your business at Structure over many years. Um, you know, people want to start these consultancies or other business or do exactly what you're doing right now. I mean, the dilemmas. I, you know, I, I'm sure that you will hear from people who will say, how did you do it? So yeah, you know, a little yeah. bit about how you got to where you are right now. I could drink so many coffees a day. You know, all these people ask me, could we sit together and you let me know how you did it? And Yes, of course, I take my time and to do uh, to do so. But, you know, there was one example just a few months ago and um, it was a woman and she told me, you know, I would like to do exactly the same as you do. Um, it's so exciting and you can really have impact. But for me, it would need it would need to be much less than you do right now. And, you know, I think that's exactly the point. It, it always takes work to build something up and it's never finished and you have to transform and you have to be in the market. You have to listen and you have, you just have to commit yourself on what you're doing. And that's not just a part-time feeling or part-time, you know, engagement you have if you build something up. No matter no matter whether you do that internally or externally, you know, with your own company or with being a leader as you are within a firm, it's always the same. It takes time, it takes work and commitment. Yeah, and sometimes people want to start you know, at the, the the top of something, you know, I, I'd like to start being on, I'm sure you've gotten this question from women and men, you know, I would like yeah. to be on corporate boards in Switzerland. How do I do this? But they're yeah. not willing to kind of do anything up to get closer to that level until... And you know, I don't know whether you also know that uh, that's joke about the overnight successes, which takes 10 years. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's really, you know, I think, yeah, but... It's wishful thinking, and I also have a lot of colleagues who are saying, "Hey, I would like to work for you." And I said, "Okay, that's fine." But um, hey, you also have to do, you know, you have to lean in, and you have to, you know, you have to have this skin in the game to build something up. Right. Right. It's some. It's not just someone's going to hire you one day, and, and and suddenly, you know, when you talk about the other requirements, you know, people don't realize all of the other things or the rough yeah. days. Um, and isn't it is interesting? And I do think <laughs> as genders women are much more prepared to start rolling up their, their sleeves and starting from the beginning. I think a lot of men, and that's one of the reasons why part of why we started the podcast was that there are a lot of women who've been doing this for a long time and built the field. And it's become such a hot area lately that suddenly you have lots of people, men and women doing a great job, but you also want to make sure the women that were kind of pushed this way or, or loved it still get a focus. Absolutely. Yep. And I think we are still different, and that's also what I like. Now, I like to have these diverse teams, no matter whether men or women. I, I wouldn't also like to sit in a board with only women, you know. I think it's the yeah. same issue um, as if we would have only boards with men. So I, I'm really a big fan of these diverse teams. 
Yeah. Right. And I think I would be, you know, not say in diversity in other ways, you know, age, experience, you know, yeah. um, gender is one thing, race, particularly in the U.S. I mean, you have to have yeah. a board that reflects what your company looks like. I mean, obviously with expertise also, um, but I think, you know, it's really important because if you, know, you don't, if you don't have people who are aware of all the risks, you're actually going to miss some things too. Yes, and you know, I think that what you said also before with the culture and a bit of self-awareness, you know, it would be so great to have these different cultures in the boards, you know, that because we learn from each other also how we communicate. And that's that's often still missing, you know, also in global boards. Yeah. Well, um, is there anything else you want to share? <sighs> My last question. No, I think you asked so many things. <laughs> no, I loved actually you. putting the <laughs> thoughts together for this. Um, and this is the one question, I, as I mentioned earlier, I mean, I love Switzerland. I spent a lot of time there. I used to, when I used to go to, to Gate Group, I still have a very dear friend in Bern. And I probably am the only person in history that people just would normally, when I'd be there over weekend, just say, bye, Lisa, are you going to Bern? Yep, I am. I'm on yes. my way now. Here's where I'm going for dinner. I mean, I, it's my first place to travel. What would you say is one of your you know, favorite things about Switzerland. Lisa, if you are back in Switzerland, I really have to show you one place. It's my favorite place. And um, when I saw it the first time, my heart was so attached and, it was, it's just my place of energy also over the last years of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And it's a beautiful place at the Lake of Lucerne. Oh, it's a great yeah. view to the scenery, to the mountains, perfect spot for sailing and reflecting on what's really important for you. And I promise when you are back in Switzerland, you have to reserve at least one day and I bring you there. I, okay? <laughs> I've been there once briefly and not long enough. So I'm available. I don't know what that good, day will good. be, but I'd like to end the pandemic for it. I mean, I just loved... I mean, I also really love the train system in Switzerland. People used to laugh because I knew where all the routes where I wanted to go. Yeah. It's the best. It is. And it's so punk. You know, we are really in time all the time. <laughs> right. In in like in the U.S. or when I take when I would come home and then I'd get on, on the subway and it, it would be late and a mess. <laughs> if you're in, in Switzerland, it was the greatest thing they'd be three minutes late and substitute a train and say we won't have you know a food a food car today they and we're very sorry we'll be three and a half minutes late well dc or it's a you're just hoping they show up at the right time it, it really is a an amazing amazing system and just being able to just sit on the lake and just the 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 life everything about it is you know there's so much gorgeous so many things that are gorgeous and peaceful and it's great yeah, you know how should I say, you know, I always feel privileged to live here because for me, it's just a hop. And I also like it. It's my home base. And I've worked in so many countries. I traveled, traveled all over the world. And I'm also hoping to do that soon again. Yeah. But I always appreciate to come back to that little place on earth where I was born. And I think it's not everything good here, but I think it's more than good enough for me. <laughs> Oh, I mean, it, 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 there's just so much. It's really, it, it's the kind of place that once you start spending more time, um, you know, and getting to know people, you know, I've gotten to know you, but my other good friends that are there, you suddenly feel like you become part of this very warm in, in world of, you know, different places to see, different ways of enjoying your environment and also working hard. It really is a special place. Yeah. Well, this is really also just so enjoyable for me. Um, thank you so much for joining me on behalf of Mary and I and the, the podcast. And I hope you're starting the new year well. Stay safe and healthy. And um, thank you so much. So thank you very much, Lisa. It was a great pleasure. And also stay healthy and come over to Switzerland as soon as possible, please. I, I'm, I'm working on it. <laughs> Believe me, I, I'm Good. working on that. That's, that is my first trip people are think all the places i said i was thinking of going before now the pandemic i mean like, i need to get back to switzerland this is ridiculous Good. So thank you so <laughs> much great. and everybody have thank a great you. day thanks. thank you bye thanks for joining us for this episode of great women in compliance we hope you'll join us in honoring the great women in the compliance field by subscribing to this podcast and leaving a review